Um, so, you're, of course, the biggest tools you can bring are just a loop and a light. Um, I like these little keychain LEDs because they're pretty bright for illuminating um, just, you know, a piece of rough at somebody's stand at, like, say, the upcoming Thunder Spirit Design Show. Um, if you ever see shapes like these, you're definitely in synthetic land. We'll talk about crystals in a bit, but these are all called bulls. So sometimes they are completely round, but they're basically shaped like bullets, and they're they're grown crystals. Um, sapphire is often split to relieve the stress, and then then they're heated again. It's called annealing. But basically, if you see a shape like this, and this is obviously just a cross section of a unsplit bull very large one, um, then you know you're dealing with synthetics. One of the reasons your loop comes in handy is because if you see flaws in it, it probably ain't synthetic. I mean, it's simple, but there are some people who go to the tr so much trouble to create good fakes that they will actually put inclusions in a synthetic stone. Um, I think my loops needs... My loop, among other things, has a screw loose. Um, but other stuff, um, there are some optical properties like refractive index, it's how much a given stone bends light. Uh, they're all basically a ratio where water is one, the amount that water bends light. Or is it just air? I don't know, there's one. Um, so there's low refractive index stones, and those when you're cutting them, you need to cut a deeper pavilion on them so that the light just doesn't pass right through them. Um, but 154, 155 range, things like uh, tourmaline and quartz all the way on up to, I wanna say 2.18 for a diamond, um, which means you can cut it real shallow and the light still will bend so much and then come across and back up the table, which is where you want all your light to do. Um, to measure refractive index, you need what's called a uh, refractometer. I didn't bring mine, it's a piece of crap. Um, but basically you can actually tell the refractive index. I brought this in that I got at a MGS meeting of all places. Refractometer. I've never used it and it doesn't have the batteries in it, but I didn't know if it was a a piece of junk or not. Yeah. The older ones actually have an open back and you can just put a light there, a light source, like a good mag light or something. Um, some of the models will actually have a screw in thing, so it's specifically you just take the hood off the mag light and screw it straight in there or a specific kind of light. But basically what's going on is you're putting your stone on this prism thing here and you don't ever want to scratch it. I have an old one that I bought that he said, oh, it's not too scratched up. And that was not the case. But you can put it on here with a little bit of, I just use um, Refractol, which you actually use for like looking at uh, flaws in gemstones. And it's got a very heavy, specific gravity. But you put a little bit of there on this little uh, prism and then rub it around, make sure the air bubbles get out. And then you just close this again with the light coming in the back, or in this case- There's a battery, it's a, it's a place for batteries, it doesn't- Yeah. So you put the stone oh. on the prism? Yeah, you put the stone there? on the prism okay. and then close this back down and then you can look through. And this one, because it's not lit, you can't see it, but right. there's a little scale and it just says oh. like 1.4, 10 ticks, 1.5, 10 ticks. Yeah, so you can see like 1.4, 1.6, 1.7, and then you can look values up and say, oh, um, this has a refractive index of 1.78, and what do you know, that's cubic zirconia, crap, or whatever the case may be. But yeah, ones like little ones like this, you can actually bring um, people that actually like go to gem markets in Africa or, is there or actual Thailand. Is there an actual readout on that device? Or? It's a scale, so what you'll do then is you'll see like a two shades of light, like it'll right. be dark and light and a shadow and the shadow and where that shadow crosses the scale is the refractive index of your stone. That's nifty. Mm -hmm. um, and they're precision instruments so they tend to be expensive which is why I just tried a couple hundred bucks on an old one to see what I got. 
I didn't pay a whole lot for this one, so I wasn't sure if I got a piece of junk or not. But You'd have to try to find try that. Try to find that. Mine, I think the prism's so scratched up, it was reading 1.54 for everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, I'm seeing all quartz. I don't know what's going on. It has to be a polished surface, a flat polished surface, doesn't it? Yeah, so there are some techniques you can try for like on a round surface that's polished, but generally, yeah, you'll want to put like, take a cut stone and put it face down on there because your table's your biggest facet. Um, along with refraction, some stones are doubly refractive. If you have a really good eye, you can sometimes see in the reflection of the pavilion facets, and you'll actually see them doubled. There's like two lines, and that'll tell you this is what's called a, a birefringent or a doubly refractive stone. Um, and optical your calcite. Optical calcite shows two lines, right? What's that? And does your refractometer show two lines? In the refractometer, you'll see two different shadows, and those will be the upper and the lower limits of that. Um, but some stones are known for being doubly refractive, like zircon can be so strong that it helps to orient it right, otherwise all your facets look blurry when you look down through the middle because it's just, it's fuzzing them. Um, some people do that by eye, like I said, uh, but that can be, again, you can have a list of, you can actually look up on the interwebs. Okay, is zircon supposed to be doubly refractive? Because it looks like this is a doubly refractive stone and I bought zircon. Yes, it is. Or I bought spinel. Maybe you didn't get spinel. Um, have, you, have you done anything with liquid uh, refractive uh, liquids? A little bit, just to hunt for fractures and flaws. Um, sometimes, especially with uh, like tourmaline, has a tendency to get really rough and have fine little inclusions along the rind, so you can drop stuff in that same reflect. Um, refractive fluid that I was talking about using with the refractometer and you can just submerse a stone in it and just stick it in there and look in through the fluid because then the fluid kind of matches the specific gravity a bit more so then you're not it kind of makes it so that the edge of the stone is no longer apparent so then you can see into the stone a little better where do you get that liquid um, I know Thomas Adamas has some, and that even doesn't smell awful because I bought some. Um, I don't remember what he calls his, though, but... There's something called refract refractol? Yeah, refractol is... If this was basically made as a, a more low-tox version of refractol. The other thing, you could, I think some people use wintergreen oil. Mm-hmm. Smells very pleasant. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, um, oh, and dispersion is another thing that you can look at. It's like the fire, the amount of rainbow you see in a stone. Um, just because certain types of stones have strong dispersion, others do not. So if you're looking at a diamond, but there's no sparkle, there's no rainbow, like in the, the, the glints you get off the facets, you're like, no, that's not diamond. Um, diamond well, is pretty... too much, it's CZ. Yeah, diamond is really high. Um, well, diamond is quite high. It's got a lot of sparkle. We'll go with that. Um, rutile is stupid high. It's like six times higher. Sphene has a bunch. Uh, that's why Sphene looks so nice. Um, the issue is, other than diamond, most of the stones that have a lot of dispersion are also very soft, like Sphene. So... Um, but synthetics, um, the first one they came up with to try to approximate the fire of diamond was uh, lithium niobate. It's just an old um, diamond simulant. And because that had a lot of sparkle, or CZ is the new one that has a lot of sparkle and still we use still most. So if you're looking at, oh, this is supposed to be, that was not too bad. Um, Unless you think you have an actual diamond, if you're used to diamonds, you can tell, or CZs, you can say, uh, this is more like CZ. I mean, you can just tell by the amount of sparkle on it, especially when they're clear. But again, that usually works better with cut stones. Um, 
color. Hue and saturation, like it should be exactly what color is it? Bluish green, greenish blue, blue. And the saturation of that color are very important to the value of gemstones, but they can't, they don't really do a whole lot to identify it. Um, I could probably show you a tanzanite and an iolite with much the same color, and you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference. They both have that purple blue kind of look. Um, what you can do is look at pleochroism which is multiple color axes. So you can see a slight difference on this one. Um, and you can, yeah, I'll pass them around. Um, if you look through, tourmaline often has one color when you look through the center of the crystal. They're kind of long hexagonal crystals. And then another color, color when you look through the side. Um, often when you see green tourmaline, like just a little pile of it at a gem seller's table. That's the stuff that you could probably hold. Look up sideways and it'll be black. And it's, that's called a closed C-axis. If you try to facet that without accounting for it, you'll just get a really dark, not good looking stone. Um, a lot of colors have two axes, but like tanzanite has three. And this is a what's called a fancy tanzanite. Often fancy means just not the color you usually associate with that word. So a sapphire that is not blue is often called fancy yellow or fancy orange sapphire. Same thing with diamonds that aren't white. So tanzanite, when it's not blue and purple, if you turn this one, you can see blue, purple, Green's a little hard to see here. It actually has a green axis on it too. Um, and I'll leave some of these up here. But one way you can really tell for sure is one little pocket thing that you can bring if you get one. It's called a dichroscope. And it just looks like a little viewfinder. That's actually where you put the stone, not your eye. Um, it's an easy one to see. I'll toss this piece around. So Iolite has a tendency to have a nice purple-blue color one way, and then you can turn it 90 degrees, and it looks like dishwater. And that's the two color axes. So light going through this way has a brown color. Light going through this way has a blue color. And if you Hold this up to a good strong light. Oh, I got there first try. It shows you two little square windows right next to each other. And you can rotate this. And at one point, like, it'll, you'll see the kind of the same color, but then you can turn it 90 degrees. And you can see the dishwater and the blue colors right next to each other. And that tells you this is a pleochroic stone, which some stones are, some stones are not. Aquamarine is not, topaz is. So if you have a light blue topaz that somebody's trying to pass off as an aquamarine, you can tell with one of these. Um, same thing with the tourmaline, especially if you view it from the side. I keep getting lucky. I was doing this at home and I did a hunt and hunt. You really need good light for this stuff too. But this one you can see like an orange and a pink side. And you can come up and play with those if you want. Um, let's do that. And another example is this sapphire. Um, especially the Australian sapphire has sometimes a blue and a green axis. And some of them are color zoned and they'll have like little yellow sections in them, which is called party color. because they were too dark. So we'll skip the sapphires for now. I was partly trying to see what works in this light too. But anyway, this can help you tell if there's more than one color axis, which can help you identify the stone. Um, tanzanite, tourmaline, sapphire, topaz, eye light, and andalusite is another one. 
I didn't bring my ring. Um, Andalusite actually has three color zones. So you can look through and you can get like a green, a beige, and a reddish orange. You know, just depending on which way you look through the crystal. Um, but if you're looking through super rough and it doesn't do that, then it's not Andalusite. I wrote some notes about crystal forms. Um, it's a lot to remember and memorize um, because for each one, like there's seven main forms plus amorphous, um, cubic, tetragonal, hexagonal, trigonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, triclinic. And each of them show up in different ways too. But it's a lot of it's just getting used to sometimes you can see the crystal shape. Like in here, you can see this kind of squashed hexagon cross-section, that's something tourmaline always does. Um, the barrels show up in um, crystals like this too, long six-sided around the side tubes basically. So that can help you tell when you've actually got what you think you've got. If it's naturally cube-shaped and somebody tells you it's an emerald, well it ain't. Cubic form is the one that's kind of easiest to recognize because they're either straight up cubes, like the big, um, what was I just talking about? Pyrite. All right. That you often see those big, gigantic crystal shapes, and they're just perfect cubes. All sides of the, all edges are the same length. Um, but then it can also be octahedrons is also cubic, where it's kind of a four-faced pyramid. How about we skip a finger? There we go. Four-faced pyramid. <laughs> and another four-phase pyramid together. Or if you've played too many role-playing games like I have, it looks like an eight-sided die. Um, fluoride shows up in that, for example. And the other one is called a dodecahedron, and it's basically 12 equal sides on a polygon. And garnet often shows up like that. Sometimes your stones are from alluvial flows, and they're river-worn, so they don't really have any crystal shapes. like. These are all just kind of blobs, the sapphire. Um, sometimes on garnets, they will be well-rounded, and sometimes they'll look like little eggs, like the anthill garnets. Um, and sometimes they'll just have really great, like, full 12-sided thing, and it's real easy to see. Um, so if you're after a particular type of stone, and especially if it is a more expensive type, then, okay, I want to get a nice tourmaline. Well, one of the things you can look up is what is a tourmaline, what is it supposed to look like? And then I'll know, am I getting a tourmaline slice or a tourmaline longer thing, or am I getting a not tourmaline? Uh, oh, another thing on color, color zoning. I mentioned the sapphires. The Australian sapphires often have like a little yellow spot in them. Depending on how you orient them, when you cut them, then you can end up with a blue stone, a more yellow stone, or a more green, green stone. But they'll zone like that. Some stone, of course, is a color zone stone because the nice ones have, and I didn't bring one, um, that kind of straw yellow base crystal, and there's just this intense little spot of red <coughs> in the center. Um, Tourmaline's interesting because you get the uh, you get the, the bicolor. Well, you get bicolor or, or tricolor tourmalines. And tourmaline does that two ways. Like sometimes you'll see the center is one color and then the outer rind is a different color. So when the outer rind is green and the center is pink, that's the classic watermelon tourmaline. Yeah. Sometimes they band along the crystal and you'll get different zones. And I've seen ones that, pictures of ones, I've never held them in hand, that have six different color zones across them. Yeah. Um, it's just crazy. But then again, red and green is another common one. Yeah. Uh, three colors are fairly common, I think, red, green, and clear. Yeah, and sometimes you'll see that clear gap right between the red and the green. Um, in general, color in gemstones comes from the metal ion impurities in it. Like all gemstones, if they were perfectly pure, would be clear. But because in beryl, if you've got um, vanadium or... Uh, uh, it's chromium. Yeah, chrome and vanadium cause yeah. green tourmaline. So if you've got yeah, chrome green. or vanadium, you'll get a, a green, green emerald. A barrel will turn it, will become an emerald, basically. Emerald is green barrel. 
Um, if there's not much but a light yellow, which might be iron. Um, I think if they have iron, they're Gaussian green iron. beryls. If, they're, if they have uh, chrome or vanadium, they're emeralds. Yeah, and it's some of these, um, because they're metals, they have different valences, yeah. so you get that mint green barrel um, from iron, but then you can also get kind of a yellow green color, like peridot, that kind of yellow green color. Um, but a lot of it is, if you know, barrels are all long hexagon crystals, and if it's green, it's called an emerald, and if it's yellow, it's called a goshenite or heliodor. If it's clear, it's called a goshenite. If it's bluish green, it's called aquamarine, but they're all barrels and they're all the same crystal. There's something called a, a red emerald, which comes from the Wawa Mountains of Washington, mm -hmm. and they're called Big Spite. Big Spite is, in general, red gemstones are super rare, and Big Spite is very rare. It can go for higher prices than diamond if you've got a nice one. I've seen, I guess, a pendant with a half carat, and they were asking like five thousand dollars for it. Mm -hmm. um, color change and color shift. So this is one. I don't know if you can all see into this room or not, but this is color shift. Um, it's yag. It's a synthetic because we talked about that. Um, yag is a type of synthetic garnet it's called yttri yttrium aluminum garnet. That's where the name yag comes from. Yeah, it might be. Roy G. Big, the order of the colors. If it goes from adjacent colors, like from blue to purple, like this one does, some people will call that just color shift. If it flips, either skips more than one color, it's called color change. Um, the classic color change stone is Alexandrite. It shifts from red to green, like opposite sides of the color wheel. Um, ultraviolet, ultraviolet fluorescence. Um, I don't have a black light, but I have what's called a 405 nanometer laser that's just like the visible edge of long wave spectrum. So most stones, oh yeah, that one's reactive. If you shine through, you just see the same purple light coming through. Or if I do that one. Is that a safe laser to look at? through a stone that's diffracting it so much you won't actually get a beam okay. in your face. Um, you know, like eye light's the same way. It just shows that, that same blue light. Some stones fluoresce under UV light, and this also works for them. So ruby does not ordinarily fluoresce. There's some kinds that do, but in general, a natural ruby will not. Synthetic pink sapphire, however, lights up like crazy and it turns its bright pink. Um, yeah, again, that's another, just that same purple blue color. See, the thing with Ruby, you can put it on a cup of water on a piece of paper and hold a magnet, and the, the, the Ruby's got some magnetic properties to it that would move towards magnet. I think if it's colored by iron or nickel, it might be. Yeah, some stones are a little magnetic, and they use, they call that like a boat test. Mm -hmm. Um... This one's a little different because you can see the light just shine through as a red, it turns red in the center of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can quite see that. Mm -hmm. do, 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 do. Appetite. Yellow appetite will fluoresce pink. So there you can see that, even though it's a yellow stone and yeah. a blue light. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of neat. But this is another cheap. Certainly less than 20 bucks, I might have paid, I don't know, 10 or 20 bucks for it. It wasn't that bad. They're making these really good uh, UV LEDs now. Yeah, you can get 50 or 60 bucks, but they're really nice. Yeah, and sometimes they'll come with like a dark field loop, so yeah. you can actually kind of put it in a little box and close all the other light out. This one was a weird one, because this one's a sapphire. Sapphire doesn't ordinarily fluoresce, but this one lights up pink like crazy. Mm. And so I did some reading and the only mention I could find of, this is probably Tanzanian, should be Tanzanian. What color is that? I can't see it, without the light. Without the light, it's a blue, it's unheated and untreated, so it's not like that super intense blue. 
and just weird cutting choices. I had a choice for cutting that for size or color, and I chose size. Um, because it does have those color axes, it was like this perfectly hemispherical thing that was like the perfect preform for a stone. And when you looked through the table, it was kind of this ice blue. But when you held it sideways, it was this nice deep blue. And I was like, uh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> but I just took the preform shape, basically. Um, but I did some reading, and I did find that some Madagascan sapphires fluoresce. And Madagascar is right across the water from the southeast corner of Africa. That's got Eric, do you want to try an uncle? Not fluoresce on those. I didn't write down too many of these, but yeah, so you just get that blue color. Yeah, just reflecting the blue. Okay. Yeah. But sometimes knowing whether the stone you're looking for fluoresces or not, because if you're expecting something that doesn't fluoresce like opal, and then it does fluoresce, maybe opal like fluoresces, I don't know. But you know, that's another kind of. All these things are indicators. They will never tell you definitely. You know, just because it does this doesn't mean it's appetite, clearly, because that's not appetite. Um, there was a story about somebody in Massachusetts that was manufacturing diamonds, and they put a chemical in the... Yeah, there's type 1 and type 2 diamonds, I think, and one of them fluoresces, the other doesn't, but you can also put, like, paper coating on it and then it looks like it's fluorescing. Um, another thing you can use are filters. This is um, an emerald or a Chelsea filter. It was originally made so you could see if your emerald was an emerald or a simulant. Um, simulant, by the way, is another stone that's just colored to look like the stone you want or otherwise resemble the stone you want. A synthetic is, is the same kind of stone, it's just man-made. So. This is synthetic pink sapphire because it has the exact same chemical, physical, crystalline properties of sapphire. Um, this is synthetic white sapphire. So if I'm calling it a sapphire, it's synthetic. But if I cut one and tell you it's supposed to look like a diamond, now we're talking. Now it's a simulant because this isn't a diamond; it's sapphire. Um, so this used to be able to tell between emerald and a lot of the things that sometimes were substituted in to look like emeralds, like peridot, tourmaline, things like that. It's not as good as synthetics. People don't really use them anymore. Um, I think I found this one in a garage sale or something. It still says the Geological <coughs> Association of Great Britain in it. There's a guy named Dr. William Hanneman who is a big proponent of not using fancy tools like spectroscopes and um, spectrometers and he's got a whole set of filters that are supposed to be really good um, that you can buy so filters are something you can look through and basically the way you use those is you hold the and they're glass they're not plastic or glass they're made of glass the Hanneman filters? the filters not that I didn't they're, know. they're plastic I believe they're plastic yeah um, I don't know if I have a strong enough light here Basically, if you can get a strong light on your stone, then you can just look at the, through the filter at it. This one's really dark, it's hard to use. I just have it more of a novelty. Um, there are filters you can use. What are you looking for? What's the uh, depends on the filter and the stone. So, you know, if you know that a ruby under this, because rubies also have chromium in them, just the other color of chromium. Um, and the filters work on the principles that like when you, I don't know if you've ever seen it, like a spectroscope, and they say, oh, this this type of material absorbs light at 906 nanometers, and that's diagnostic of ruby or whatever. Well, then this also is made to let that light through so you can see it. Um, so they're based on, like, very specific colors, so you have to know that, oh, this is what an appetite from this place will look like under this filter. Okay. Um, and everything else would be black. You'd just see the thing. Or just the same color the, as it is, kind of, or green.
because this is a green filter. filters online. Um, hardness. Eric, speaking of filters, I remember one time we had a, somebody doing a, a lamp work bead demonstration and she had glasses which filtered out the uh, oh. yellow from sodium. Psycho, you know? yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that's basically the same principle that welding goggles and yeah. shields are made on. Um, a lot of times when I'm melting stuff with the especially the uh, oxyacetylene torch that gets so bright, I'll sometimes at least grab a pair of sunglasses because... What, what frequency of the oxyacetylene? I don't know. They have special glasses, though, for... Yeah, you can get them in a Robert's Oxygen acid. This is what you wear when you work with the kiln oil. Okay. If you have to look into a hot kiln light, you can wear the same glasses that will protect the glass. Yeah. And some of the stuff, like the flasks or whatever you have that's glowing that red, that can cause some wear and tear. And a lot of it depends on, like, if you're doing one thing, you know, if I'm just, especially with just the ox or acetylene air torches, they're not bad. They're, we use most of the time, but that little mini torch is oxyacetylene that puts out a super bright flame, especially if you put a big melting head on it. And I'm using, like, if I do one thing, it takes me a little bit to recover. If I did that a lot, I would wear goggles all the time. It's like malachite. You, know, you want to be careful about it because copper dust can cause problems in your lungs. If you're doing Robert, one and you're doing it wet, you're fine. If you're doing them all day and often, then you should be wearing protection. Robert's oxygen has the glasses for? Um, they have them, but you can get them at Rio, too. Rio? They're in their um, soldering section and killing section. Okay. Yeah, and you can probably just look up safety glasses or something. Um, we talked a little bit about flaws. Again, one of the main things is you don't have flaws in synthetics most of the time. Um, the stone was something my mom gave me, and she said, Yeah, your Aunt Kathy used to have it. She was my godmother, too. So she always said it was her amethyst. And I looked at it, I'm like, There's. It's got a fair amount of sparkle, and there's like zero flaws in this thing. I just don't, I'm pretty sure it's not amethyst. And then I looked at it through here, because I was playing around. And when you hold it sideways. Is it that way? There. Maybe. I'm not sure, it's real subtle. I might be getting like a reddish purple and a more bluish purple, but that means it's slightly dichroic, which means maybe it's, um, it's garnet on that list. No, I don't know. But again, like you, you can't always identify with these techniques, but I can go, not amethyst. Um, another one you can do is hardness, especially if you have a crystal and you know you're not gonna be doing much with, like you know, tourmaline should be about as hard as just the quartzes around there. Um, so yes, a diamond should scratch it. If a dot or if, if uh, like a piece of corundum doesn't scratch it, then this is corundum, and which means somebody fooled you and maybe it's synthetic corundum. Um, If you wanted to test for hardness, um, the Mohs hardness scale for gem stuff, quartz is seven, topaz is eight, no, quartz is six, topaz is seven, eight is barrel, nine is corundum, 10 is diamond. Um, and the other reason that's handy is generally seven or above is what you want in rings, um, especially daily wear rings. So when somebody said, hey, I want an opal in my wedding ring or in my engagement ring, I'm like, at the very least, I'm going to strongly advise you not to, unless you only wear it on special occasions, and that's not a very good kind of engagement ring. So it would be better as a pendant or a brooch or something like that. Yeah. Um, or a cocktail ring, 
something you wear on special occasions. Yeah. Not an everyday in the dishwater. <laughs> yeah. And a hardness isn't everything. There's also just a general toughness. Like diamond is the hardest material, but jade is the toughest mineral in the world. And regardless of its hardness, you can wear that in the ring. Um, words to watch out for? Actually, we talked our grandson from his high school ring from Malachite to Jade. It's <laughs> 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 like, no, you don't want a high school ring with Malachite. <laughs> yeah. Well, and somebody was looking for, they wanted a pinkish-orange engagement stone.